Well, hey, if you got your life notes, go ahead and pull them out with you this morning. We're going to um, start our new message series, and uh, I'm going to do a little housekeeping and set it up for us um, as we get uh, kind of rocking and rolling um, this morning. But if you got your Bibles and you'll go ahead and turn, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to be in Genesis chapter 2. Um, that's where we're going to land both um, today. And so uh, Pastor Chris kind of um, brought up the fact of us starting our 21 days of prayer and fasting. That'll start next Sunday. Highly, highly encourage you guys to engage with us um, as much as you possibly can. Uh, Jesus actually taught his disciples. He didn't say if you fast. He said when you fast. And he gave instruction that fasting should be a part of just the normal um, pursuit and the normal uh, lifestyle of biblical Christianity. We're going to talk about some of that today of what is normal Christianity should it look like and how should it be defined? And so as we start this message series entitled Poles, Tents, and can somebody read for me today? Holy things. Poles, Tents, and Holy Things. Um, Brad, what do you mean by that? We're actually going to look at whenever Moses brought the children of Israel across the Red Sea and one of the first things that God started to do, and watch this, this is really, really good, but it's a little deep and a little heavy, but you, can, you, know, you guys can handle this. And um, it's, when he brought them across, God immediately started recalibrating the way that they think. So what do you mean by that? For 400 years, these, uh, the children of Israel had been in bondage in Egypt and they were brought out of Egypt, beautiful picture of salvation that happens for us as uh, believers in Jesus Christ and that, that by the blood of the lamb they put on the doorpost um, that they were brought out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea, beautiful picture of water baptism uh, that happens in the life of a New Testament believer. And they find themselves in this new season of life. And one of the first things that God starts doing is recalibrating the way that, that, that he has a relationship with them. He gives and downloads. This is where God gives Moses the, the, the Ten Commandments. This is where uh, God shows Moses, hey, uh, I want to have a meeting place with you. And it's called the tabernacle. And um, inside the tabernacle, there was pieces of, of uh, furniture that were called holy things. It was the laver. It was the uh, table of showbread. Really kind of some big things. You say, well, I've heard people say that before, but what did it mean? These next few weeks, we're really going to put some handles on that. And hopefully uh, you can apply apply that to your life as a follower of Jesus. But what do we mean by poles, tents, and holy things? God told Moses, he said, Moses, he said, I want you to follow the cloud by day and the fire by night to follow me in my presence and let me lead you in the wilderness. How many know that God still leads us and God still guides us? So y'all with me today? God's got a plan for your life this year. He leads us and he guides. He said, my sheep shall know my voice. He, he uh, guides our footsteps. And this is how he told Moses. And he gave us this beautiful picture of poles, tents, and holy things. He said, Moses, as you follow me, there's going to be poles, there's tents to the tabernacle, and there's holy things. He said, and so as you're following me, poles and tents need to be put on ox carts. They need to be put on the, the backs of the ox carts so that they're not a pressure or a weight or a stress for my people. Get this with me. But the holy things, I want you to carry them on the shoulders of men that is meant to be a weight. How does that apply to you and I? And why are we even talking about this for the next few weeks? That poles and tents, what does it represent? It's the structure that happens inside of our life. That there's pressure that happens because you got bills to pay and because Joe Wheeler or Hearts Utilities is going to send uh, a bill to you. You got a cell phone bill. You got to eat. You got to drive a car. They, they say you got, you got to drive a car. You got to have insurance. And, and that's all the poles and tents and structure and the way you do things. And you all wake up in the morning and go to, go to your workplace. And it's the, the poles and tents of life that often are the weight that we carry and stress us out and put a weight inside of our life. But God says he doesn't want the poles and tents of our life to be a weight or be the, the biggest stress in our life. He wants us to carry a weight of concerning ourselves with the holy things that God has for us. So y'all with me today? It's a little bit deep, but it's that saying the table of shoe bread represents the word of God, the, the labor that's, that represents cleansing. It's the, the, that aspect of me realizing, God, you got the poles and the tents and you got that worked out. And I, God, I know I gotta have structure in my life and I gotta get all this figured out and that's great. And let me get that structure and organization. God, but let me get my attention and my focus on being a carrier of your presence of the Ark of the Covenant. Let that be a weight. That's what God wants you and I to go into 2023, realize and 
poles and tents have their place. You gotta have structure or nothing's gonna stand up. That's why some of us have struggled in life is because you lack structure in your life. Are y'all with me? You gotta have structure so they can hold up the poles and the tents, but then we carry those holy things and whenever we have all that moving together, my friend, God will move us and we follow his presence and his love and what he wants to do inside of us. So Brad, why are you saying all that to us? It's because these next few weeks you don't wanna miss. We're gonna drill a little bit deep, but we're gonna lean into how do we carry the holy things of God in our life? How do I get structure and have poles and tents in my life that's honoring to the Lord that can hold the what he wants to do inside of us. And that takes me to the part where we're talking about there in your life notes. On the top of your life notes, I put this simple word. I put normal Christianity. Normal defined, all right, uh, is this. And so let me me bounce here and I'll come back to it. Normal Christianity. What is normal defined? Normal is conforming to a type or a standard of regular pattern characterized by what is considered usual, typical, or routine. See, normal, I've seen, I'm 45 years old, and I've watched normal change every few years around me. Normal, when I was growing up, is you'd go outside and play in the dirt and ride. If you had a four-wheeler, it means that you were probably rich, and you, it's like we had to go to our friend's house to ride a four-wheeler. And uh, you'd go outside, you'd play football after, after school or baseball or whatever with your friends. Normal today is, what's the newest Xbox game you got? Normal has changed on what's acceptable. And so normal defined by the Journal of Science actually says it's when society accepts at a 95 percentile, they say this is the standard. And so as you and I live life, I wanna ask you a question. What is normal? What does normal look like in your life? Because we let our normal be defined by what Hollywood says. We let normal be defined by the peer pressure and the status quo, MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, everybody else. What does the latest Hollywood movie stars say is popular and famous and that that becomes our normal and our standard. And y'all saw a few of the pictures. I'm going to bounce back here. Back in the 60s, this was normal dress and normal attire. All right. One lady in first service was like, oh, I got one of those in my closet still. All right. This is what normal dress looked like. Then you bump into the 70s, right? And you could totally play. Hey, that's 70 attire. And uh, some of y'all, anybody, no, anybody, child of the 70s, a few in here, that means you'd be in your 50s. And uh, we've got a few people, all right? And you go, hey, look, I still got that hanging in my closet. And uh, you can tell, that's what normal looked like. You come bouncing in here with bell-bottom pants on and wearing this attire today, and everybody's gonna go, that's not normal. <laughs> y'all with me? Why? Because the world standard of normal changes every few years. This is what normal looks like. And if we're not careful, why are we talking about this is because we will allow the world to define what a normal Christian should look like. We say, oh, this is now what is socially and politically correct, acceptable in society. And it doesn't mean that the church over the years has even gotten it all right. See, I'm not as concerned about you and I allowing ourselves to be a normal Christian according to a denomination or according to a preference or a style that somebody said, and normal means you need to have the red back hymnal and you sing page 188 and it's this style of music or normal has to have stone glass windows on the side or normal has to look like this or look like that because the truth is I'm not as concerned about being normal to the world as us looking and saying what does normal look like in scripture? What does the Bible say about normal? Because the truth is, is that I am more concerned about looking normal according to scripture and I will probably look abnormal to the world. And the problem that exists is whenever you try to look normal to the world and you try to set your standard and let the world define what normal is, that will get you in trouble, my friend. That'll leave you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you ever wanted to pay because they'll say, for you to get joy, you got to turn up a bottle. For you to get uh, happiness in your life, you got to have this and that. And, And it is the normal thought process that will suck you in on what it takes to live life. And it's not looking at scripture and saying, what is the Bible? say normal should look like. What's normal Christianity? This is 70s and about this bunch of y'all 80s babies in here, all right? And it's too legit, too legit to quit. Nobody picked up what I was laying down, all right? <laughs> Can't touch this and you ain't never gonna touch it, right? So then there was the hairspray. Anybody remember the name of that? Uh, oh, some of y'all. 
You could still smell the Aquanet in the room. And when it came to hairstyles for the girls, it was bigger is better, baby, all right? And uh, tease it up and poof it out. And I don't remember what they called these windbreakers, but that was just, I was a baby of the 80s, and that's what it looked like. You wear this in here today, and it's going to be like, it's not normal. <laughs> Why? Because normal changes. And today, I want us to simply just to look back and bounce and say, what does normal Christianity look like? And I'm going to show you from Scripture what the Bible teaches that normal Christianity should define. But the Bible says, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change his standard of what a normal Christian should look like. I'm not talking about, see, the problem we get into is a lot of times when you go, oh, that means I got to wear this kind of dress. No, his normal, he just gives us in scriptures talking about modest dress. It doesn't mean that you got to have a bun up in your hair and a skirt down to your ankles. And are y'all with me today? It's that understanding whenever he says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what is a normal Christian and what should it look like? Um, we're going to look back at creation to the Adamic covenant. You can write these down and we're going to talk more about this later. At Moses. So there's three places that we can see where God defines some truths and some principles. The, the Adamic covenant was at creation whenever God created Adam and Eve and they walked through the garden in the cool of the day. Sin had entered the picture at this point in time. Then we're going to look at the Mosaic covenant whenever God had uh, encountered Moses and the children of Israel and he downloaded the Ten Commandments and he taught them all those things and he showed them the tabernacle and how they should function, how they should live and then it's gonna fast forward all the way to the new covenant as be a New Testament follower of Jesus Christ but what I'm seeing and learning and watching in scripture is there's actually a thread that runs all the way through all three of these that is normal Christianity. This is the heart of God and what God wants to do and what God desires for us. Acts chapter two, starting in verse 42 we're going to look in. This is the first church that is a New Testament, New Covenant church that existed when we can look back and see the birthplace of how a church should act and how a church should live. Acts 2, 42. They devoted themselves. This is the church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and the signs performed by the apostle. Everybody say Normal. So you see what we just read? It's what they devoted themselves to, normal. Breaking of bread, normal. Signs and wonders, normal. This is the way it's happening. This is what took place. It was not abnormal. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Everybody say normal. normal. They met in the temple courts. They gathered together. They loved each other. They shared the resources they had inside of their life. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I'm gonna give you four normals that you and I need to be pursuing in our life. Number one, it is normal to grow. It's a posture of growth in our life should be normal. And if you have lost your appetite for spiritual growth and growing in God and growing in who he's called you to be and growing in, in uh, becoming who he has called you to become, if you've lost that desire in your heart, it's because, my friend, you are sitting back and you are abnormal to the things of the wor word and you are normal to the things of the world. The normal things of the world is do all I can, can all I get, sit on the can. Be lazy, be apathetic, play the, play the system, work the system. Do this and do that and get more money, get more popularity, get more power, get more fame. And what I'm talking to you today is about how our normal pursuit of growth, see healthy things should grow. It is not normal for some, a 15 year old to still be drinking from a bottle. It's not normal. Like Pastor Brad, I've been saved for Five years, I've been saved for 10 years, but you are still drinking from the bottle and your spiritual maturity is anemic and weak and you are, uh, I'm just gonna speak plain, it's the third service, you are a crybaby that still has dirty diapers that you need somebody to come along to help you change and it's because you're not growing and you're not maturing in who God has called you to be. Y'all with me today? It's that understanding, no, normal things, it should be normal for us to have a posture to grow. And not be satisfied being stuck and stagnant in my, my self-depression and my lack and my laziness and hate and anger and racism and hurt and pain and depression and anxiety. And I get stale and stuck and it 
I said, that's just normal. That's just part of how you live life. No, my friend, you need to grow as a Christian. It's to say, I am grow, I am hungry. Acts chapter two actually shows what I just read to you. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching. Why would they devote themselves to biblical teaching? Why would they devote themselves to biblical principles being de- deposited inside of their heart? Because look at this, the, the men and women that were in this New Testament church, they had grew up as good little Jewish men and uh, boys and girls. They had heard prayers. They had been to uh, rabbi's teachings. They had heard every philosophy and theory they could possibly hear. But all of a sudden, they tapped into the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there was something stirred inside them that said, I've got to grow. Everybody say grow. Come on, if you're not growing, my friend, you are dying and you are moving backwards. And if you want to pursue the word of God and growing in God, it is normal to grow. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the word of God. They devoted themselves to scripture. They devoted themselves to to, to going and buying a book that helps me to walk in victory. They devoted themselves to the truths of the principle of God's word. Instead of devoting themselves to what the world says, I need to devote myself to building my power, to getting my stuff, to getting my thing, to doing this. But they devoted themselves. It's normal to have a pursuit to grow in your life. Healthy things should grow. Let me, I'll give you a little nugget here, and then we're going to move on. Spiritual growth is the exact opposite of physical growth. Today, if you do not eat, you didn't eat breakfast, you don't eat lunch, you don't eat dinner, come about 8, 30, 9 o'clock, you can be like, dude, I am about to starve to death. Let's go to Burger King, get a Whopper with cheese, heavy ketchup, no onion, cut in half, and a large Coke, right? Brad Sheet's favorite meal. You can tell. <laughs> so why? Because the absence of food in my physical nature will cause me to hunger for it. The absence of food in my spiritual growth will cause me to become hardened and I lose my appetite in pursuit. You go two, three, four days and you have not partaken, eaten on spiritual growth in your life, all of a sudden you're not hungry no more and you've lost your appetites. It's the exact opposite of what happens in your physical body. But it's normal for a New Testament Christian to have a hunger and say, I'm, I'm growing, I'm maturing, I'm becoming who God called me to become. Number two, it's normal to need relationships. God did not intend for you to, to do life by yourself. In the words of the great theologian, Ernest T. Bass from the Andy Griffith Show, He said, I'm going to find a cave and go hermitize myself. That is not God's will for your life. Are y'all with me today? God desires for us to have relationships. It's how he made us. It's relationships with one another. That's why it's our father which art in heaven. That's why we're called brothers and sisters in Christ. That is why God instituted and watch that thin line happens from the Adamic covenant with Adam and Eve all the way through the Mosaic covenant, all the way to the New Testament covenant that God has created you and I to walk in relationships. Watch this, Acts chapter two. They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread. Come on, somebody. He said, they devoted themselves, they devoted. What does that mean? It means that I am staying disciplined and committed to doing this, whether I feel like it or I don't feel like it, that I'm gonna be your friend, I'm gonna be in a relationship, I'm gonna hang out, we're gonna go to Cracker Barrel and grab some food, break some bread, get some biscuits, right? We are going to be in relationship with each other because it is normal Christianity to walk in arm in arm linked with somebody that has got your back. Are y'all with me today? It's the way God intended it doesn't mean that person is perfect. You're pursuing the one who is perfect. And, and, and I'm chasing my, my passion for Jesus Christ, but at the same time, I realize that I am to be in relationship with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Genesis, that Adamic covenant that I told you about, Genesis chapter two, the Lord said, it is not good for man to do what? We quote this scripture in reference to marriage all the time. We don't know what Adam was doing. High possibility, Adam was running through the garden with a pair of scissors. And Jesus said, or God said, God said, this ain't good. Adam's gonna hurt himself. We gotta give him a wife to tell him what to do, all right? (laughs) I'm just playing. (laughs) And so he said, 
He said, man, it's not good for man to be alone. It's, it's speaking directly to marriage, but it also is, has a reference and an inference to relationships with mankind that we couldn't find a companionship among other animals. And you can say a dog is a man's best friend, but God meant every one of us in this room to have relationships with each other, that you need a brother in Christ. You need a sister in Christ. You have somebody that's got your back. You got somebody who can tell you your breast stinks. You got somebody who can tell you you're, you got a booger in your nose. Are y'all with me today? Because we all need a friend. We all need somebody. And it is normal Christianity to be in a relationship with people. Number three, there in your notes, it's normal to commune with God. Completely normal. Abnormal for the world. Maybe even a little bit weird. But it should be completely normal for followers of Jesus Christ to go, hey, I, 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 I need to commune with my God. It's how God has built us. Watch this, Acts 2.44. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their property and possession to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. What were they doing in the temple courts? They were going to worship. I don't think it's scriptural precedence that we said we got to gather together here in this building because the church is not these four walls. This is a gathering place for the body of life, church, to be able to gather together. But ha listen to me today. You can commune and meet with God in your bedroom. You can meet with him in your living room. You can meet with him sitting in your car. You can go on your back porch and have communion with God. It should be completely normal for our heart to yearn, to commune with uh, that spiritual connection with the God of the universe to say, God, I need to commune with you. Can I get an Amen. I need communion with God. So they met in the temple courts. Adam and Eve shows us in Genesis chapter three. He says, the man and his wife heard the sound. This is right after they had committed the original sin, right? So I'm showing you again the Adamic covenant in this thine that goes that commune with God. The man heard his wife and the son of the Lord was walking in the cool of the garden of the day and they hid from the Lord. I can't wait to the day when I, I want to talk to Adam and say, hey, tell me what it was like in the original Garden of Eden. It's one of the first conversations I want to have when I get to heaven. I want to know what it was like when God walked in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve, that it was normal for them to commune with God. And the first thing that happened when sin come in the picture is what? Is God shows up, they went and they hid. Do you hide from communion with God? Do you hide from and reject? I ain't got time. I'm too busy. I got too much going on, but I've got plenty of time for Netflix and YouTube and social media and get on my phone. And I got plenty of time to do all this other stuff. But God, I'm, I'm hiding from going in his presence and commune with him because it's abnormal to our flesh, but it should be normal Christianity. Number four in our notes, band, go ahead and come up with me. It's normal for supernatural to be natural. That we serve a God that still answers prayers. We serve a God that when you pray, we should be actively seeing his hand at work in our life. Let me show you. It goes on in scripture. Acts 2 says, they devoted themselves to the apostle teaching fellowship bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with all the many signs and wonders that were performed by the apostles. The supernatural was natural. Wasn't weird, wasn't goofy. I love verses like James that says, if there's any sick among you, let them pray the prayer of faith. Have the elder church pray the prayer of faith and we'd see healing. I love John 14, 12 that says, greater things shall you do than I have done because I go to be with the Father. I love, he tells us that we can walk in that spiritual awareness and the supernatural awareness. It's not weird. It's not goofy. It may be abnormal for uh, the world, but it should be extremely normal for New Testament followers of Jesus Christ. My friend, even in this room, whenever you say that you've given your life to Jesus and you're saved, guess what? Salvation is one of the greatest miracles that can ever happen inside of a man or a woman's heart that you once was lost, but now you're found. You've been born again. It's a supernatural occurrence inside of our life and inside of our heart that the miraculous should be normal. 
God should be a God that's answering prayers in his believers' lives. Can I get an amen? Come on, he should be a God showing himself mighty on your behalf, opening up doors supernatural that there's no way that door should have ever opened for you. Closing the door on what the enemy wants to do and bring death and destruction and despair inside of your life. It's a supernatural uh, understanding that it should be normal in the Christian world. It should be normal Christianity for us to have interactions with the supernatural to manifest in our life on a regular basis. Look what God did. Look at the prayer God answered. Look how he changed this person's life and heart. Look how he healed this person's body. Look how he provided supernaturally in this situation. Look how God brought supernatural peace that surpasses all understanding in the life and the heart of somebody who was about to commit suicide, but now they found hope and purpose that we serve a supernatural God and supernatural occurrences and miracles should manifest in the lives, in the hearts of normal Christians on a weekly basis. Are y'all there with me? Matter of fact, not even a weekly basis, but watch this. I'm gonna back up just because I love y'all and y'all are that special. I'm backing up to a verse. Here we go. Here it is, verse 47. Praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number. How often? Wow. Those who are being saved. Normal Christianity. People giving their life to Jesus daily. People experiencing relationships daily. People having communion with God, normal Christianity, communion with God. Give us this day our daily bread. But God has to recalibrate what normal is. We're about to land this plane and we're almost done. I want you to listen to me today. Lean in with me. When the children of Israel came across the Red Sea, Moses goes up the mountain, he's getting the Ten Commandments. While the children of Israel are down at the bottom, they literally said, Here, if you don't hear anything, I say, Little, listen to me. They literally said, Let's worship Yahweh that delivered us out of Egypt. That sounds great. But they're normal for 400 years, their normal worship was God golden statues when they come across here let's worship God that just delivered us but they wanted to keep their normal mentality the same and they formed a golden calf is it possible that God wants to recalibrate your normal God, I want to worship you, but I want to live the same lifestyle I led in Egypt. Where I find my peace at the bottom of a bottle. I find my joy in people and stuff and money. And I find my happiness in addictions and habits. And God, I really do want to worship you because I know you're real. I know you're good. I know you're God. But, the, but I still want my golden calves in my life because that's what I think normal is and what normal looks like. What would happen if there was a group or what would happen in a man or woman's life that made a decision to say, God, you recalibrate what normal looks like. I don't want my normal standard to be the way it's always been. I don't want my normal standard to be what Egypt looked like. I need you to shift inside of me. God, I don't want to make any golden calves. I don't want to try to, to pursue you and change chase you, but recalibrate literally the way that I think and redefine what normal looks like in my life and heart. It's a new normal for you, my friend. 2023, what if God recalibrated normal? You've dealt with depression and anxiety and worry and fear. What if that's your normal, but now God says, hey, let me recalibrate that for you. Now, your new normal is going to be hope, peace, purpose, and destiny. Your, your old normal was, I've got to get my buzz. I've got to get my high. I've got to get my addiction. I've got to get whatever the struggle or the trial, the tribulation, the temptation was. Your new normal is, can nobody love me like Jesus? I'm going to commune with him. Can nobody give me joy like my Jesus can? Can't nobody give me peace like communion with my God does. He's here, church family. Every head, body, every eye closed. Don't you listen to me. He's here this morning. 
And I think there's a recalibration that he wants to do. That we're not pursuing normal according to the world standards. That we're pursuing normal according to what the Bible says. I want to be a normal Christian. Not normal according to what personal preference or denominations or somebody else might say, I want to be a normal Christian according to what the word of God says. Jesus, redefine us. Redefine us today, Jesus. Come on right there. Can you just ask him? Holy Spirit, how does this message apply to me? God, what do you want to change? Where, where does my normal need to shift? Maybe I need to let him help me grow. Because the truth is I'm so immature and weak and anemic in my pursuit and my journey of being a Christ follower. God, help me grow. Maybe it's a book, maybe it's a podcast, maybe it's reading scripture, maybe it's a mentor, whatever. God, help me grow. So we thank you, Jesus, for today. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would transform us. But everyone, nobody moving around, all right? I want you, with all respect and honor this morning, can you stand up on your feet with me today? Come on, everybody in this room, stand up on your feet with me today. I'm going to invite some of our, our prayer team to come, some of our leaders to come. If you want somebody to pray and agree with you today, let's, guess what? The altar should be normal. Asking a brother or sister to pray for you should be normal. So some of our leaders come, I'm going to open these altars up. If you want somebody to pray with you, man, we'd love to. Or if you just want to spend some time by yourself. But I really, I want to do a whole room altar call today too. But it's specifically, you, you want somebody to just agree with. It's safe, it's good. Man, there's times we say, hey, pray with me. It should be normal. The altar, come to the altar should be normal. Say, so I need somebody to pray about open doors, closed doors. I need to pray somebody, just whatever, whatever the situation. In all things we give to God in prayer. So these altars are open. If, if you want to get out of your seat and come find some, one of these men or women to pray with you or just find you a place at the altar by yourself, completely fine this morning. But I want for all, those, all of us in, this, in the auditorium, this whole room to be an altar space this morning. Come on, right there where you're at. Can you lift your hands with me? If you say, you know what, Brad? I'm ready to be a normal follower of Christ. I don't want my normal to be set according to the standard of this world. I want my normal to be set according to the word of God. According to the word of God. Come on, from front to back, side to side. Can you lift your hands right now just in surrender? Saying, God, I give it to you, Jesus. Go ahead and be vocal. Tell him. Say, I, I, I may look abnormal to this world, God, but I want to I look normal to you. I want to look normal to the biblical standard. I want to look normal to what the word of God says. God, help me to grow, help me to pursue relationships, help me to pursue communion with you. Help me, God, to, to embrace the supernatural in my life. God, help me. Father, today I pray for every man, woman, and child underneath the sound of my voice. I pray that today will be a day of redefining normal. God, I pray we'd no longer be satisfied with the normal status quo, the pressure that comes with the, the political correctness in Hollywood and what society says we need in our life. God, but I pray today that there would just be a posture of your word in our life. Father, God, that we welcome the the new normal. God, we welcome a normal pursuit that it's normal to pray. It's normal to fast. It's normal to read your word. Lord, it becomes normal to be a giver. It becomes normal to be someone who loves unconditionally. It becomes normal to be someone who forgives quickly. It becomes normal to be an encourager. It becomes normal to be a worshiper. It becomes normal to be a pursuer of God. Lord, that a new normal would be in our midst, Father, in our hearts and our lives. And today we welcome you in the name of Jesus. Pastor Anthony, to begin to lead us in a moment of worship right here. And I want us, come on, from front to back, side to side. I want us just to engage right here. Can y'all sing this with Pastor Anthony? Let's lift our hands and just ask him, say, God, let there be a new normal inside of my life. Let there be a new normal. Lord, of how great, how awesome, how powerful, how mighty you are. And we worship you in this place in the name of Jesus. Come on, sing this with Pastor Anthony. 